Hello, I'm Darlene Shoemaker, a master volunteer gardener through the Ohio State University in Mar County, Ohio. We are trained volunteers that are empowered to educate with timely research-based gardening information. At the top of the picture beside me is a um, monarch butterfly. A little further down, you'll see a bee that is covered with pollen. And we also have five types of pollinators here uh, being shown. We have bats and birds, butterflies, bees, and beetles. And I'm there on the left and I am volunteering on a hops farm. And today I'm going to talk about pollinators and how important they are to the food supply. In uh, 2012, there was a study at Cornell University and they estimate that bees and other insect pollinators contribute 29 billion annually to US farm income by pollinating 58 crops, including almonds, apples, berries, and squash. Pollinators play a key role in the production of many of the foods in the home garden. Birds, bats, bees, butterflies, beetles, and other small mammals that pollinate plants are responsible for bringing us one out of every three bites of food. Most people think of honeybees as pollinators. These pollinators include bees in a colony, European type, and solitary bees like yellow jackets. Now on the finger on the left is a picture of a honey, of a uh, bumblebee. And bumblebees are not as aggressive and likely to sting as are hornets and yellow jackets. Males cannot sting and females only do so when they feel threatened. Their stings, however, are painful and could be dangerous to those with allergies. In addition, unlike honeybees, bumblebees are capable of stinging multiple times. And the other picture of the bees are two honeybees on a flower. Here we have a semi that is full of uh, beehives. This is from Honey Run Farm in Williamsport, Ohio, and they're shipping these bees to pollinate almonds in California. They ship them in December and they'll be there through March. The almonds need honeybees to uh, be pollinated for 100% of their food crop. Here we're attracting pollinators to the uh, garden on, uh, from Ohio online. And this is through our Ag Extension uh, Agency. And the first one has to do with a, with a fact sheet. And the second one has to do with um, various things of bees and other, other types of pollinators uh, that uh, is in our garden. So this talks about how pollinators find flowers. Flowers are a variety, have a variety of uh, strategies to attract pollinators, including petal color, scent, UV light patterns, and nectar guides. Bees in particular use floral qualities such as polarized light lamp patterns, petal texture, temperature, humidity, and electrosound charge to help them locate the flowers. Here is uh, another part of the attracting on the poll pollinator gardens. On the left, and you can see bee in a um, is put with an aster flower is pollinating and getting nectar. On the right, you'll see how attracting pollinators to your garden is also by using native plants. In this case here, this is a ruby-throated hummingbird, hummingbird on a trumpet vine. These are different types of flower types attractive to pollinators. We have birds, bats, bees, beetles, butterflies, fly, uh, regular flies, moths, and wind. And that's uh, and then the plant trait is on the left. So you have your different colors that attract each one of those. And also the nectar guides. Some of them are absent, some of them are present. And the wind, of course, is probably the most interesting one since um, they don't need anything to absolutely you know, attract them. Uh, wind might uh, be a good example with uh, 
dandelions and also milkweed seeds, how they just take off and uh, blow in the wind. And then you also have odor and the different smells and nectar, pollen, and even the flower shape is uh, particularly attracted to uh, certain types of these pollinators. So the pollinator habitat, uh, it, you have to have diversity in it. And the bloom times should be a minimum of three bloom periods. And they need nesting places and roosting places, overwintering places like bare ground, sandy soil, burrows, hollow stemmed and cavities in plants and some of the host plants. And of course with the honeybees, we have artificial and besides brush piles and leaf debris. Now, the National Pollinator Week is coming up in June. It's June 21st through the 27th. You'll take and find the various things that you can take and do. And besides those pollinator events, we have Earth Day, World Bee Day, Pollinator Week, Moth Week, and just below it, we have the bat week. Pollinator, monarchs and pollinator habitats helps other wildlife too. The picture on the left is a picture of monarch butterflies. They actually hibernate in the south. There are two kinds of monarch butterflies. One that lives west of the Rockies and they are along the west coast and they actually winter down in southern part of California. And then there's those that are east of the Rockies, which is through all the plain states. And the two types of butterflies never co-mingle, but the ones that are on the east side of the Rockies actually migrate to Mexico and, and various places. In 1971, when I was living on a small farm outside Fort Wayne, Indiana, I thought when I saw the, all these beautiful butter, monarch butterflies in the uh, cypress trees there, that that is what I needed to plant when I got my own place to uh, attract those beautiful monarch butterflies. And they were absolutely covered. There were thousands in there. And I later learned that that was their migration path. So monarchs and pollinator habitat helps other wildlife too. And this is with the pheasant and quail management of forever. So the picture on the left with the uh, coneflower has a nice little frog helping to pollinate it. And then we have other kinds of birds, uh, the ring, ring neck pheasants and other couple of other birds. Plus we have a little rabbit. So in the end, what's good for pollinator monarchs is good for pheasants, quail, and other game, non-game wildlife that need grassland habitat. Life field, the ODNR, Guides in Backyard Wildlife. I'm showing here pictures of five of the milkweeds, the butterfly weed, the common milkweed, the purple milkweed, Sullivan's milkweed, and the swamp milkweed. Out of those, I have at least three or four on my farm uh, near Marengo with, um, with a lot of the swamp milkweed because it likes uh, some of our very wet pastures. And this is uh, important for monarchs because it's the only host plant that uh, they use to survive on to uh, eat and lay their eggs and um, then the when it takes and hatches and it just it'll consume the entire milkweed plant. This here is something that really got me interested in webinars. I have a limited amount of time working full-time plus farming full-time. And this here slide kind of says it all. Webinars, you can actually listen to them. They take about an hour of time and they're on all kinds of different topics. 
And so now in our pandemic, they're really valuable. But this here has to do with the lawn to pollinator habitat transitions. And it's saying $500 or 12 hours acres a year. So the picture on the left is a picture of just nothing but grass. Now, when a pollinator flies over this or sees it, to them it looks like a desert. But however, on the right now, we have something that the pollinators would enjoy. The pollinator habitat establishment is a one-time expense. You can have it contracted, so it's going to cost between $451 to $801 an acre, or you can do it yourself at $324 to $774 an acre. No matter what, it's going to take about seven hours per acre, 12 hours on the project. So we have pictures of the seeds and you have to prep it because you have to kill all the grass and then be able to seed it. Mowing grass versus pollinator maintenance. And this is the expense per acre per year. So if you have it contracted, it's going to cost you $502 to take and mow the grass. And, uh, but if you maintain the pollinator habitat, it's only $36. If you do it yourself, it's going to take you 13 hours of your time to mow the grass. Otherwise, just to maintain the pollinator habitat, it's going to be less than an hour. So we have $42 and zero. This slide helped me tremendously on some of my projects on the farm realizing how I didn't need to take and plant everything in grass and mow. And the case study said, says it all. These slides had come from uh, Iowa State. So the Central Iowa Livestock Corporation, their break even was two years, 600 to $1,200 an acre savings. And the Eastern Iowa Corporation with 15 acres, their break even, two years, $400 an acre for savings for a total of $6,000 a year on savings. Conclusion, stop mowing. $450 or 12 hours per acre per year for cost savings. All you have to do is do a site prep and get the right seed mix by quality mix, plant in the dormant seed season seed to soil contact and calibrate the planter. Manage the habitat. Connect with your local conservationist, the NRCS, the DNR, Pheasants Forever, or the County Conservation Board. This is pictures of what I, that I took and did with those thoughts in mind. So I use flowers along an alpaca pasture for pollinators. It was difficult to mow and it's along a driveway, so I planted perennials last year. Different colors and shapes for bees, hummingbirds, and butterflies. Same area, but I started planting in the fall for spring pollinators because bulbs are great because they come up year after year. And here we have a picture with the, through the CRP going through the uh, USDA. This is the Harmon Ditch in Henry County that flows into the Maumee River. It has 4.3 acres and meanders through our fields with six feet of land strip per side. It is kept as a natural habitat for wildlife and pollinators. So the pictures that I have taken, the one on the, the, the left is coming down through uh, the field's upland, and the one on the right is going toward the river. Farmers get into really helping everything when it comes to pollinators. Eric Niedemeyer's farm in Delaware County, he planted this beautiful field of sunflowers. He actually encouraged people that stopped to uh, take pictures 
and then take and send them to him. So besides, there's a bonus for raising sunflowers for pollinators. The sunflower seeds will produce a great food source for various kinds of wildlife. Here is a picture of various types of endangered pollinators. Of course, the monarchs are on there, and there are certain kinds of bats and bees and birds and butterflies, and even a certain kind of hummingbird. Ohio bee identification. There are 500 species of bees in Ohio. This fact sheet provides key features needed to identify 10 types of bees found in home landscapes. This is another one where you can cop bees or vegetarian and only eat pollen and nectar from flowers. And the picture on the left that I really blew up, pretty good size. You can see where almonds need bees 100%. Apples need bees 90%, blueberries 90%. Cherries are not shown on here, but cherries also need bees for 90%. Peaches, 48%. Oranges, 27%. Cotton, 16 And soybeans, 5 At this point, I really want to thank all of these people for their credits on my on my being able to put this whole presentation together. This is Darlin Shoemaker.